third Ottoman hook blade has two parts, you see. You see. What's up, everybody? I'm the Hook, and I am the Blade, and welcome to the Book Blade Podcast, the official <laughs> Assassin's Creed book club. Yeah, <laughs> I've been thinking that we should retitle the show Assassin's Read. Wow, yeah, for sure. No, I think actually, that'd yeah. be really clever. I think that could work. What's up, bra man? What's up? Has anything <laughs> interesting happened in your life recently? Well, it's funny you ask me that <laughs> because, um, okay, so I'm kind of a slut for like big brand integration into like fast food stuff. Really? Like for instance, I believe it was earlier this year that Cheetos did a sandwich with KFC. Uh Uh-huh. And it was the greatest thing and it was the greatest thing ever. Yeah. Um, so recently I picked myself up a carton of the Lucky Charms ice cream. Whoa. I don't know if anyone has seen this in their stores. So they have Cinnamon Toast Crunch and they have Lucky Charms and I'm more of a Lucky Charms guy. Wrong, so, but sure. <laughs> I picked I picked up uh, a carton of it, and I was expecting to hate it, but it is legitimately Lucky Charm cereal in like frozen form. Wow! I can't recommend it enough to people who like Lucky Charms. Nothing interesting happened to me this week besides turning twenty one. Yeah, which but itself that's pretty is interesting though. It's not that interesting. Yeah, I guess you're right. We have some notes at the top of the show for you guys. First of all, we're probably a day late on this episode. Sorry about that. Uh, Sorry. Life happens. The aforementioned turning 21 got in the way of recording this week. Um, I'm yeah, also you son still... of a bitch. <laughs> I'm also still very sick, uh, so forgive any vocal weirdness that may occur. And then also, I'm in the process of helping my family move out of the house, so if you hear any random like thud noises... It's probably because my sister is too weak to carry whatever she's trying to carry. So you might hear something, you know, unexpected. She's dropping all your plates. Yeah, she keeps she keeps breaking the china. She's like a bull in a china shop. <laughs> she's like a she's like a smeed in a china shop. Hey, speaking of cattle, we're here to talk about Assassin's Creed Brahmin this week. Woo! I have a fun Brahmin related anecdote. I read this book when around when it came out in 2013 mm-hmm. or so. I never knew even then uh, until just now what the word Brahmin actually meant in this context. Mm-hmm. I had only ever heard it used in reference to cows. And I was like, I know India really fucks with cows, but I didn't think they went that hard for them to name their VR essentially cow VR. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> but I looked it up. Brahmin does mean something that has nothing to do with cows. Brahmin is um, apparently the word means the ultimate reality underlying all phenomena of existence. Right, yeah. That's the definition I got, too. Yeah. So it makes a lot more sense as the name of a VR helmet to be like, this is the, you know, the God particle VR helmet or whatever. Right. Sorry, does this come off disrespectful to Hinduism? Because I I don't I don't mean to come at it like that. Trust me. I'm not offended. Well, as long as you're not offended. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's interesting you say that because I I did think one of the more interesting thing about uh, more interesting thing uh, things about this book is how it implied that um, Absurgo kind of would outsource certain technology creation yeah. to other companies. Well, it's like a cool. It's like one of the only things I can think of where we get to look into the modern day happenings of a country that's not the United States, more or less. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But I also think it adds another layer of the, like, in more of the modern day context, we're, especially recently, with since, since Black Flag, and when we were, yeah. when, when we were showing all the Abstergo happenings, it's interesting to me how so many people are kind of involved with the Templars, but have no idea who right. are ultimately innocent. I mean, Abstergo, what would be the closest analog to Abstergo in modern, real world? Uh, I don't know. There's maybe nothing. They're kind of a pharmaceutical company and a technology company and yeah. entertainment. It's probably if you took like the most influential pharmaceutical company and mixed it with Apple and then you'd have Absurgo. Yeah. And I'm not discounting the possibility that Apple is a front for an evil organization that's existed for centuries. I'm not, I'm not throwing that out just yet. <laughs> yeah. So first off, spoilers for Brahmin. Um, but just to catch you up to speed, if you haven't read it in a while, just a brief overview off the top of my head, basically Brahmin is the story of modern day programmer Jatsura, who is married to, well, no, he's engaged to 
a a you know Bollywood movie star, uh, Monima Das. Mm-hmm. Forgive me if I'm butchering the pronunciation of these names because I didn't check on that at all. Um, basically, he's working on a version of the Abstergo VR helmet pseudo animus thing for the Indian market. And in doing so, he discovers this lineage in 1800s India where he was essentially a poor street urchin type boy who helps out assassin Arbaz Mir on a epic adventure to protect slash steal the Koinur diamond for the assassins. I'm glad that you pronounced it so that I didn't have to fuck it up somehow. I'm still, I'm not sure that that's exactly how it's pronounced, <laughs> but I'm like, I'm like 70% on it. I, I had a hard time pronouncing it in my head before I knew how you had how to say it. Koinur. Which, what is the name of the thing that they also call it, which is a more Indian, like, folklore, mystical jewel oh, yeah, gem? They, yeah, they call it, they call it a couple, it has, like, many different names. Um, Mountain of Light, isn't that, like, the, that, that, well, that's the English translation, is Mountain of Light. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna find out. Sayamantakamani. Yeah, that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, th- it was interesting to see a piece of Eden that kind of works in tangent with other pieces of Eden. Like, it's not, it's, I mean, it, it does something on its own. But I, as far as I am aware, the implication is that if you pair it with, like, say, an apple, it would be even more powerful. Ah. That kind of, that, I mean, that's my read of it. That's pretty cool. I kind of didn't pay that much attention to what the Koenur actually does because it, it's almost not that important. Well, perhaps it doesn't, amplify other powers of the of, of piece of Eden, but like I, I'm looking on the wiki page here oh, and it yeah. says it can it can I was locate just pulling it up. It can locate other pieces of Eden, so oh, um that's cool. Yeah. So yeah, I guess I was wrong. It does it doesn't amplify necessarily, but it can locate, so there's that. Does the Koinur appear in Assassin's Creed Syndicate? Um, I think the connection there is because... It does. So it appears in the game? Mm-hmm. Not just in the book? Yeah, no, not just in the book. I think there's a mission where you have to steal it. Really? Yes. The Great On Jewel the, uh... Heist. Oh, wait. Now, what is this? <laughs> it's a rabbit hole. Okay, it's... Okay, okay, okay. It's DLC. It's in The Last Maharaja. Oh, I never played that me played that DLC. Or maybe Uh-oh. I did. I don't know. So, the thing um, that's most striking to me as... So, disclaimer, this is my first time reading the book. Right, you haven't um, read it before. In fact, I think it's kind of funny to mention that yeah. uh, basically about a week ago, Tim came to me and he was like, well, he messaged me. He was like, I'm going to go read AC Brahman because, you know, I like The Fall in the Chain a lot. It's the same guys. I was like, don't bother <laughs> Yeah, don't bother. It sucked. I was like, it's it's okay. It's not that great. There's not much to talk about. Granted, this is going off of my recollections from 2013. So I'm like, you know, I just hadn't read it in a while. And then I reread it right. because Tim liked it a lot. And I was like, oh, this is actually really good. Yeah. So I'm upset I didn't read it sooner because I always just kind of felt like The Fall on the Chain was like the more popular of the two, and that was the only one worth reading, and mm-hmm. I was so wrong, because I actually think I like Brahmin more than I like The Fall or The Chain. Yeah, um, I'm kind of, my position on this is that I like, I like The Fall the most of the three, and then Brahmin's a little bit under it, and then The Chain is a little bit under that. So they're all very close together in terms of preference and enjoyability and quality but i do like the fall better personally and the thing that is most striking to me as i started reading it was um the artwork um is actually a lot more i don't want to say cartoonish but there's it's so expressive in terms of how the characters look like in the modern day yeah it's 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 very and, it's I, and I suppose that's you're right and i think that's because of the brahmin vr headset allows you to view it in different genres. Yeah, that was a cool little so, detail. Yeah. So I, I think that might be why all of everyone is kind of like a caricature. Like you have the mustache um, guy who, you know, it just is very, very animated <laughs> yeah. compared to the modern day characters, you know? And like Arbaz is... Yeah, Arbaz doesn't like, look like a real person. Yeah, he's he's like cut from stone. Yeah. 
Yeah. He's so unrealistically think, handsome. Yeah, so I think that's that, that, that's part of what happened there. But it's it's really refreshing because it's like just looking at some of these characters, you can tell who they are and what their intentions are. Something cool that they brought over from when they did the Fall in the Chain is there are a couple of really cool full full page spreads in this oh, book. Yeah, the sure. art is is a lot more, I think, noticeably high quality in this book. Because oh, there yeah. are some great agree. layouts. There's some great examples of like rhythm and um, continuity between panels as far as like things outside of the borders. And they just they got a lot more expressive and free form with it. You read something like Conspiracies, which we talked about last week, and like it is just it's just panels. Like they never they yeah. don't do any full page spreads. Nothing is extending beyond the borders of the panel, which you know, it's a it's a valid stylistic choice to do it that way. But I feel like this book is a great example of how you can take advantage of the fact that it is a comic. Right. And that is a highlight of a lot like a lot of good artists and comics is mm-hmm. they really go um, uh, they, they really think outside the box in terms of panels. Um, and like I'm, I'm just looking at a page here and yeah. there you have like your bot like you have like your full page layout and you got some panels and then you have characters going outside of those panels and it's just it's very entertaining to to look through and i think that's part of why this book moves so gracefully it's very kinetic right it, it it's you don't get bored looking at it with conspiracies it's not very colorful mm-hmm. the panels are, are very average and typical that's like a good a bad comic can definitely be brought up by very expressive artwork and this is the case of very expressive artwork with a good comic yeah so. i mean the characters in this are so well drawn. I think for me, the the biggest strength of this story is actually the same thing that made me like it less when I read it the first time as a, you know, as a 14 year old is that right. it's not very high stakes in the grander scheme of Assassin's Creed stories. It's not world ending. It's not, you know, this terrible crisis of drama. And it also doesn't quite feel maybe essential to the story in the same way that something like The Fall did. For in sure. terms of how it portrays the purge and the inextricable connections to the stakes and status of the modern day assassins at that time in the games. Right. Of course, we got a couple of delightful tie ins to Assassin's Creed Syndicate. Like, as I mentioned, you know, the Koei Noor showing up in the DLC, the fact that Henry mm-hmm. Green is a main character being the son of Arbazmir. That's, you know, a great example of when the books and the games are able to work cohesively together. But as far as the story being told in this book on a modern day level, it is the best execution of any story in Assassin's Creed of portraying the everyday average Joe type character who gets caught up in the crossfire. Oh, yes. 100%. I I completely agree with you. And to go off of your point of the low stakes, I think that's why I find it so charming. Yeah. Is that's and that's why I think it. I like it more than the fall or the chain is because while, you know, our opinions on, on that is very well litigated, I really like how this book it's like I could have no knowledge of it at all. Yeah. And I didn't for a long time. And I still enjoyed the games and all of that. But now like f- like I didn't read this comic and feel like I have to devote my the rest of my life to finding every tie-in and every piece of lore. And I didn't get lost in the weeds. It was a nice story. I didn't have to go pull up the wiki no. just to understand it. Yeah. You know? So it's it was I, I just I really enjoyed it. I, I hope one day the expanded universe content is more like this. Mm-hmm. Because it wasn't obsessed with making like with elevating the game somehow or taking on a story from the game somehow. And I imagine the, the syndicate connections were made when were made much later when syndicate was being um, brought up, but they're not at all like contradictory or, or overbearing to the enjoyment of the book. Like I haven't even played Chronicles India and I still enjoyed it, you know? So I think what this really tells us and what this gets at something that's important for us to, mentioned considering some of the things we've talked about before is that there are many different approaches you can take as far as the relationship in an assassin's creed story between the modern day and the historical sections and at the end of the day the most important thing is whether or not the story is good because when we sung the praises of the fall one thing we talked a lot about was the fact that 
it gave you this context for the events of the modern day story. It was very much giving you information that enhanced your experience of playing the games. This Brahmin is not doing that, but it doesn't matter because the story that it tells in its, you know, delightful, charming, standalone way is just on its own so compelling. That said, for everything that I really, really like about this book, I do have some problems with it. Oh, yeah? So maybe we can fight each other one-on-one fist fight in yeah, the podcast. Yeah, because I... Yeah, I don't, I, I don't have really any any major gripes. I mean, I have, I well, sorry, I have gripes. I don't have any problems with it. I didn't, I, I don't have anything I dislike mm. about it. So I'm interested to hear what you have to say. I guess that. problems is overstating it. Like I'll start with a real nitpicky thing. What? Okie dokie. What the hell's up with those Templar goons that are like wearing full on suits, but also like a Cyclops bug helmet? <laughs> oh oh yeah What's, what, um, what are they <laughs> that's that's de- i i guess they're like fucking seal team six or something but of stargo but there's like a thousand of them so it's the to say? it's quite possibly one of the dumbest like henchman character designs i've ever seen in a, in a comic. I, I i liked it i thought it looked cool yeah but it, it like looks cool until you think about it for more than a half second because yeah, why it, are they it, wearing suits <laughs> Well, <laughs> because you, that's the thing. It's so cartoonish. You can differentiate everything yeah. at, at just a glance. It's just when you're, when you're trying to, this is just a design the artist thought was cool. So they used it for the Templar baddies. But like, if you're going to be tactically like kitted out to go hunt down a trained assassin, you're not going to do it wearing like a full three piece, like <laughs> suit ensemble i mean you look fresh as hell but you're not tactically effective so i agree with what you're saying because this is definitely a concept of of like these abstergo agents that kind of look like robots they do they They might be robots i don't know (laughs) i don't think so um just because i think it's shown in one of the panels it's like just kind of like an infrared mask Um, right my thing with it is while to your point they seem to introduce it in this book and then just never, ever, like, yeah. all of the Abstergo agents we ever see past this are just security they're, guards. Yeah, they're normal-looking people. They're not, like, wearing yes. this. Still, just a very, uh, I think, bad design. I, I don't know. I disagree. Very, very minor. This is right. the nittiest of nitpicks. For me, I think one thing that's true about this book for me is that the the modern-day story pretty massively outshines the historical stuff. Yeah, I I mean, yeah. I read the story a week ago. I would be hard-pressed to recall any specific details about the past or even really about Arbaz Mir as a character. You know, I do agree with you that I think I got more out of the modern-day part than I did the historical part um, in this instance. Uh, I just, I don't know if I agree that, like, the historical part is... Well, okay, I know that you're not saying you think the historical part is bad. No. But there were definitely some quirks to it that I still think about. And I and, and like you, I read it about a week ago. For, for me, most of what the historical part does well is create the emotional stakes for the modern day story. Just the mere fact, premise wise, that you have Jot, who is engaged to a woman who, you know, he probably feels like is out of his league. She goes yeah. into the VR and she sees this past as a, you know, a royal princess who's having a relationship with the sexiest man ever created. <laughs> and when when Jot goes into the VR, he's seeing like through the eyes of a little deaf mute kid while someone else basically cucks him. Yeah, I like mean, he gets to watch the hottest man ever created uh, get jiggy with the love of his life basically well you know that's the thing is i love that twist because i think everyone it, it definitely leads you to believe that he's arbaz and his yeah. and his animus findings because they even throw in that uh mon throws in that line where she's like i wonder if we knew each other yeah. in the past and it's like they do but not in the way that you would expect and i really think they handle the twist very well when he's looking in the mirror and he just hears mongrel, you know, and he sees he sees his an, his uh, his ancestor. So well done. Oh, yeah. Plus, you get that little whiff of incest potentially. 
Like you get that little thought, like when you are thinking that he's Arbaz in the past and she's the princess, you're like, are they related? But they're not. Right. Yeah. The story is yeah. incest free. Yeah, yeah. Thankfully. I mean, most good stories are right. Absolutely. Most. Yeah. I love the setup of having this <laughs> character who really just thinks that everything around him is telling him he's inferior. He's not the the charming lead of the historical story. He's not, you know, on the level of his movie star girlfriend. He's not important or famous or desirable enough for her to be open to the public about their relationship. Like, they create such a deep level of empathy for this guy. Because oh, yeah. we've all been there. We all have felt insufficient, felt like we're not enough. And this is a guy who totally just is that. And I do think one of my qualms with the story is that I'm not sure that the book, I'm not sure that the book delivers on the promise of that setup. I'm not sure we ever get a moment quite explicitly, for, for instance, that Jot like realizes that he is... He is good enough. He's caught in the crossfire. He goes through this incredibly unfortunate and terrible experience. And then it's basically over. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say, though, that the intention was to make him seem like like for him to realize, oh, I am a badass. No, no, you're right. And it would have been pretty cliche if they had done that. But but not but but I'm not saying I wanted him to turn out to be a badass or to find his heroism or, or anything like that. I'm just saying I wanted there to be a moment where he like accepted himself and became okay with himself or realized that it didn't matter if he's a movie star or if he's the charming hero that he's like got value as a person. And the reason I want to see that happen is because that's what we want to tell ourselves, right? We want to be able to say, right, for sure. I have value yeah. too, even though I'm not the, the most handsome man in the world. I'm not dating a movie star right. or whatever. Yeah, I and I agree with that. I think, yeah, I'm, I'm not insinuating that you wanted him to become an assassin or anything right. like that. Um, I will say that I do like the ending. I think the ending is, is very charming. I, I know um, at the ending of the book in the modern day section, I know I'm torn between it because I think mm. it's very well done and I love the... I'm, I, I really didn't expect them to show like a flashback of their relationship because... When we see their relationship, like, at the start, he's using the Brahmin stuff, and then she gets a hold of it, and their relationship starts tanking after that. So it was nice to see their relationship as it was good. Mm. Um, I will say, though, I really think the main issue I have with Brahmin is that it wasn't given the length of the fall in the chain. It's 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 mm, well done for its length. It's very well done for its length. I think but you're like, wrong and also stupid. <laughs> it's very well done for its length, but, the, like, think about it. We don't see, like, our Baz, we don't see him, like, until the Chronicles India. We don't see um, Jot at all anymore, as far as I'm aware. So, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Like, I would, I think it'd be cool to get more stories about them. But I think that is a different point than to say that Brahmin should be longer. Okay, which is which, yes. which point okay. are you making? I think yes. Okay, now that you put it that way, I would have liked to see maybe a different comic with these two. Maybe now that the, yeah. this this particular one should have been longer. It's just because the fall on the chain. They, I don't think it's like I, I don't ever think that the concept is that the fall would have existed without the chain. They're, I think they were made at the same. They were made with both in mind of each I other. I don't think that's true. I think they made the fall and it did well enough financially and critically that they said hey let's let's do another one with these guys how well how far off was the chain from the it was about a year it seems about a year apart well yeah but if you think about it comics are released monthly yeah but it's not like it's a six-part series that was collected into two three-issue volumes it's like it was a three-part series followed by a distinct three-part series Right, but I I would imagine that the concept of like I'm sure they were like oh, okay let's do the sequel now but I would like to imagine that they were that they knew about the chain when they were writing and the I fall. think that explains I think I think that they that the chain was not planned when they released the fall and that makes sense because when the fall when the chain released or actually ooh no here's the smoking gun dude. When they collected the issues, they included an epilogue at the end of the fall to set up the chain. 
So I think that they only would have done that had they felt like they didn't get the chance to do that setup because they didn't know they were going to get the chain when they did the fall. You, you say it's an epilogue that sets up the chain. Yeah, there is an epilogue that was added to the fall only when it was collected by UB Workshop and collected by Titan Comics. So if you read the Subject 4 version or you read uh, the Titan Comics Fall in the Chain collection, there's like an extra, I want to say 15 pages that isn't in the original comic. I read the Subject 4 version, so... Yeah, you had that I'll go setup. just go fuck myself. That's what I'm saying. I had the epilogue? Yeah, what do you mean? The, there's, there's extra pages at the end of the fall, I believe. Is that what... Okay, ugh. Maybe. <laughs> I, I, what, what I'm trying to get at, Tim, is you're wrong and also stupid. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, but the fall and the chain aside, yeah. <laughs> back, that's what I was saying was, um, okay, so perhaps that's more of a compliment to the fall and the chain that it seems like they were always planned from the get-go. Is, yeah. Yeah, so I just, I think like, because Arbaz, for instance, as much as I love him in the book, he doesn't really have an arc. He doesn't, Right, change very much without the story. He's just this charming, and I love him. And I love his characterization in the book. Um, I love his interactions with other characters. Also, this particular book did it, the Templar assassin conflict very well for me because I enjoyed seeing one a person of power who was impartial to, to both, and I enjoyed seeing um, Arbaz and the like Templar knight guy kind of have have a little uh, battle of the wits. For a yeah, second. that was great. That was a great moment. Very memorable. That's yeah. what sticks out for me of the historical stuff. For sure. Because the, cause they both acknowledge each other. And they're like, hey, bitch, don't get in the way of my mission. And he's like, oh, I'm not going to get in the way of your mission, bitch. <laughs> Which is essentially verbatim what they say. <laughs> we were talking about the ending a moment ago before we got way in the weeds. Yes. This may be a dumb bitch question. Tell You can tell me if this is a dumb bitch question. Can you confirm or deny my understanding that what we're seeing at the end of the flashback is we are seeing Jatsura relive that memory in the Brahmin? Yeah, um, I think what it is is because you can download the footage, correct? So yeah. I think what he's doing is he's he is viewing a downloaded version of the footage because the Brahmin headset is destroyed. So I think he was able to upload it to his phone because in the image of his phone. We see her, yeah. so so we are seeing his his memories. And we get that sort of like hers. delicate hint of white room design in their environment too. Oh yeah, for sure. So yeah, I no yeah you, I I think you're right. That's definitely what's happening. And there. for me, that's like a really cool ending because like something that actually naturally occurred in my head as a question while I was reading it was, I wonder if you can relive like like. They never talk about in Assassin's Creed the idea of using an animus to relive your own memories, even though, obviously, if you're going to try and convince us that we can see the memories of our ancestors in our genes, it's probably even easier to access the memories of our own damn selves. Oh, yeah, for sure. I, and that's a, I, I'm sure there's some um, animus lore out there that would explain that better, but I, I've always had the thought, like, what if I wanted to view my memories from, like, last yeah, week? Yeah, they don't really possible? explore that so, so much. And there's also the fact that in Brahmin, when he's using the VR headset, they they do make it pretty clear that the the idea of going into your genetic memory is not necessarily like a something you're supposed to be able to do with it as a consumer product, correct? Well, I think what it is is it's harvesting like genetic data and right. um, Jot is not supposed to be aware of that. Yeah. His boss just seems very aware of it. So I think what's happening is it's as we know, you know, Abstergo is like selling games. So I think it's like, hey, check out this new VR headset. And while you think you're playing a personalized game, you're just reliving some uh, a memory. And I think that's where the uh, genres come in. Because if you put in like action, yeah. you're not so much thinking about, oh, these are my memories. It's just a game you're playing. And so then they take your genetic data and they're like, okay, so... Uh, and they, and they, I guess they just use it as like market research yeah. for pieces of Eden. Because that was something that fucked me off about the story when I first read it was I really bristled at the whole Animus VR headset thing because I felt like <clears throat> it made the whole idea of an Animus kind of feel less important. I don't know. It just it, it felt convenient that this crazy high tech thing that was suddenly like a highly constructed and elaborate hospital bed sort of thing in the first game was suddenly like, you know, 
I, I have one in my house. You can house. buy at the grocery store. I have one plugged into my computer at home and I don't even know it. Right. And I and I well, I will say, I don't love the the idea of oh, Absurgo is all is like modern day Ubisoft yeah. and they make video games for the public. I don't care for that level of meta storytelling personally. It definitely diluted the potency of the world building in Assassin's Creed to start using that technology in whatever way that was most convenient for the writers. And that year, 2013, between Brahmin and Black Flag was the year that it all started going a little downhill in that regard. Right. And I, and I will say I, I prefer Brahmin's interpretation of it because I think, I think it still plays with the like fear about your memories being harvested. Yeah. It's very similar to that. Uh, like clay cosmetic truth yeah. um glyph where the guy is like flipping through channels and he and he sees his like all of his personal information and he's not supposed to uncover it so I, the idea is that um Absurgo has now been able to streamline the animus and they you can just put it on your fucking head and then you're in it and you, but you don't know you're in it you just think you're playing a fucking video game so um but yeah you're you're, you're, you're completely right it definitely started then and was propelled in Black Flag. I want to talk out my read of Brahmin and, and bounce it off of you a little bit because... Yeah. Because I'm I'm still in the process of trying to figure out how I really feel about the ending because there are kind of two different ways I can take it. One which uh -huh. I, is like fine but maybe not perfectly well earned and the other which is like mm, cheap and lazy. The story of Brahmin for the modern day characters for Jatsura... His assumption about the world that he has is that he's in this loving, deep, true, honest relationship with a woman who is a movie star. And and he mostly doesn't feel inadequate about this, right? He's played as kind of a bumbling, almost awkward programmer type dude. But when you see mm -hmm. them together, their dynamic is he's confident. He loves her. He knows she loves him. Then he learns that she's had this animus experience in the Brahmin VR headset where she's had basically a sexual encounter in the past through her genetic memory with Arba Azmir. She is so affected by this experience and has this sense of, I've never felt this way before, right? Arba is right. being this swashbuckling, charming, sexy man versus her fiance, who's kind of a... Kind of bit of a goober, bit of a goober. So Jot now has to confront this as he unfurls the conspiracy that is playing out in front of him of what exactly this VR headset is doing. And in the end, he is trying to reconnect with Monima when he's pulled into the battle. He's pulled into this conspiracy where him pretending to be better than he was by telling his coworker that he was experiencing the memories of an assassin by trying to believe that, you know, he is related to Ar Arbazmir. He is the hero. That is directly what gets him in trouble because she is an assassin. She kidnaps him believing she can access those memories and the ensuing fallout leads to the death of Monoma leads to the death of his fiance. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I was just going to add his also not only that you're right. It gets him into the crossfire, but not only that him saying him suggesting he has this lineage is also what allows him to be saved over Mon. Right. Yeah. So, so he gets bit in the ass by carrying himself by, by representing himself as though he is greater than he really is though. His lineage is more important than it really is, even though it's an innocent Little white lie. It has all these consequences. Mm -hmm. So we have to think from this sequence of events, because the very first impression it leaves on me reading it now in the context of our modern social, you know, world is that it kind of sucks that Monima being this actually, you know, having the actually important lineage being a worthwhile character in her own right, she's kind of, she's put in that awkward territory where despite being a legitimate character in her own right, she's killed off to serve the narrative of the man. It's a little, like, I'm not trying to be all, you know, 
white knighty SJW crusader here, but I am feeling like, like her death isn't maybe necessary to the story the book was trying to tell other than just rubbing the salt in Jot's wounds and ending on a bit of a downer. Yeah, I mean, but that's the thing, right? Is if they did say, if she did survive that crash and they went through her memories, then they would have found everything they needed and everything would have been fine. Even though she didn't survive the crash, they were still able to go through her memories. They still got what they needed, did they not? They, well, they got what she had uploaded. So, like, because they, because she, but her brief usage of it, I, I guess, uploaded enough for them to track. Right. So. And then they. I was expecting. They made the Templars. Sorry. Go ahead. I was expecting when they're, when he's, when the assassin is pulling Jot out of the wreckage and leaving Monoma behind. I was expecting that that was going to lead to a moment where, you know, John has to reveal, like, it's her who has, she's the one who's special, you know. He doesn't get the chance to do that because, you know, the story wants her to die. But also, it doesn't matter anyway because as soon as they're in the context for him to make that revelation, they pretty much find another way to accomplish the goal that they were trying to accomplish anyway. So then, you know, the, the co-worker girl dies and now we're at two dead women to fuel the angst of the two living men in the story. (laughs) And then it's like, was it necessary? Did it, was it, was the death of these characters inextricably tied to the thematic revelation or purpose of the story? I don't think so, but I'm open to being convinced otherwise because I'm perfectly aware of the possibility that I'm maybe just not reading the theme right. Because by the time the book is over, the the moment it chooses to end on is him reliving this memory of his relationship. And what I'm thinking I'm supposed to get from that is that what was really important all along was this love, was this relationship, and that Jot should never have been so questioning of her love for him, which is perfectly fine and good as an ending and where you would expect that that story to go it's satisfying it's good it works except she's dead now so all he can do is relive those memories and we're just left with the presumption of a guy who's going to relive those memories a bunch which is just the same ending but a little sadder so did it need to be that sad by virtue of her death did her death accomplish enough in terms of conveying the message I know I'm speaking in circles here. Please weigh in. Well, I, I get, well, so what would you do differently if you, if let's say she doesn't die, what, what would be your goal? <sighs> well, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, I'm not the writers. I don't know what they wanted the story to be about, but I do think that if the ultimate message of the story is that Jot is enough and he should never have been worried about her love for him, that in the end, You know, maybe he chooses to keep her. He chooses her. Maybe he's confronted with a choice between her and something that would actually help further the assassin's cause. Fuck the assassins. Fuck the greater cause. I'm here to be in love with my beautiful fiance and have a happily ever after. Like, that could have been an interesting ending. But you could propose any number of different endings I just think that they either should have left her alive or let her death serve a more purposeful role in the narrative. Like, if if her death meant that the assassins could not get anything they wanted, then it would really have to kind of deal with that fact, and it would actually create an obstacle for them to overcome, for Jot and the assassins to overcome. As it stands, she dies, and then it's basically over because they have what they need, and then he feels really bad about it. But there's not really a choice that Jot makes at any point other than the choice to lie about being an assassin, which is not one he's aware of the potential consequences for. Well, the problem, though, is she was kind of a target anyway because of her connection to the the diamond. So it's not like... For instance, when when Jot and 
before, like, when the van crashes, they're trying to, like, they're being, they're trying to be, uh, what's the word? They're trying to be, uh, like, snatched up by the uh, Psargo rob- uh, robot mm-hmm. guys, and, um, that the assassin, the male assassin guy, you know, hops down and tries to save them, and because he's only aware that his only lead is Jot, that's why he only, he only has time to get him yeah. out, so I think that's the, that's where it's like, if only I hadn't have lied, mm-hmm. About and and like you said, it's so innocent, you know. And it, right, and, it's and so is shitty. the overall it's, it's purpose like of the events know. really to punish Jot for a, a little white lie? No, I, I I don't I don't think it's to punish, but 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 ultimately, her genetic data is what leads them to the to what they need anyway, to the information that they need anyway. Excuse me, because her enough of her information was uploaded to where he could relive her memories. And that's what led them to the ancestry they needed. Yeah. And that's how they were able to trick the Templars into knowing that... Or, sorry, not into knowing, into thinking that they had a dead end, you know? I, I don't know. I got it. To your point about uh, Mon's death and everything, I, 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 I can't say I thought about it too much. Um, I just thought that she was a... Got caught in... The, she was a casualty of this fight that... Because, unfortunately, Jot whether he liked it or not, was involved in Abstergo dealings because of his... Like, he was already being watched by an assassin character anyway. Or, you know, yeah, Templar character, I think, in the form of his boss. Right, but his secretary is yes. the female assassin. And it should be noted that the only reason the assassins have any idea about either of them is because Jot talks to the spy, whereas Abstergo can probably see when the Brahmin is connected to the internet, like, okay, this is whose memory this is. And they know who to look for. I think that they had the opportunity to do that sort of a choice for Jot of love versus the cause, which is something that Assassin's Creed likes doing. There is a scene in the movie where that's essentially what is the choice that Aguilar has to make. He's like, I really love this assassin girl, but if I kill her, then she can't tell the Templars any of our secrets. So she's like, you should kill me right now, Aguilar. And he's like, but I don't want to. And, like, if I cared about Aguilar, that would have been really interesting. I do care about Jot, but he doesn't really have a choice to make at the end of the story. He doesn't really have a moment where he crosses between being a passive character and being an active character in terms of his influence on the plot. And really, for me, that's, like, the only thing holding it back from, like, true phenomenal greatness for me. Right. I, I see what you're saying. I guess I just really got wrapped up in Jot's perspective. Like, he went... The thing is, is he was worried that Mon was, like, cheating on him, which is why he flew to her in the first place. Oh, yeah. It's kind of his... It's kind of his, oh, You know, like, I feel like I, it's kind of I his... remembered that wrong. Like, I remembered that as him going there to be with her. What? Well, he does, but he's very anxious about... Like, what the fuck is going on? She's He even makes a sly comment about, like, what's going on between you and my boss? Oh, you're right. Yeah, I forgot about that. So I guess really the whole the whole arc of the story is Jot's insecurities are the undoing of himself and the people around him. Yeah, he, he, I mean, because that's the thing is he could have been much more trusting yeah. of her and not have let... Because he projects his insecurities, his position underneath her because she's this famous supermodel actress and he's just a tech yeah. guy and he doesn't he doesn't really step back and say well that you know as you said he doesn't accept that she that she loves him and he gets caught in this crossfire and unfortunately she gets wrapped up in it and while it might not be inherently his fault he, you know it's she got caught in the she got caught in the crossfire between him of Sergo the assassins and unfortunately, I feel like something like this would have happened anyway, even if the assassins didn't contact him, because they would have known right. that, like, as soon as she put on that the, VR yeah, headset. Yeah, the Templars were going to come after them, regardless. Right. And they did, you yeah. know? And and they, because once they were leaving, because once, once they were leaving uh, to go to the police, they were interrupted by Templars, so they were kind of fucked from the get-go on this one. I think I still come away feeling like it maybe isn't the best look or the best choice to have 
two male characters motivated in the end by the loss of a female companion for for Jot being his fiance and the assassin guy being his sister. That said, I do think if we look at it from the perspective of like, this is the cost of projecting your insecurity. If this is the cost of being insecure, then I do think there is there is a, a, a theme there that makes sense as far as how it all comes together. And that isn't bad storytelling. It's just like a choice that I wouldn't have made myself. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. No, I, 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 yeah, I, I see where you're coming from. I think, I definitely think overall it's my favorite of the comics that we've read for sure. Um, and I say for sure because conspiracies just flash through my head and it's like, yeah, this is, Leagues better than anything, uh, any of that, Nate, any mm-hmm. of that shit. I'm but, still gonna go with the um, fall as my favorite, mainly because I like Russia and Nikolai right, better, yeah. and also just because I feel like while he approached the problem and takes of having a you know, having a more low stakes character story is totally valid and 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 awesome in a way that I didn't respect in 2013, but respect the hell out of now. I still love the the whole element of Daniel Cross and the influence yeah. that he has on the events of the games, the way that they personalize it and make it potent and powerful in the context of that comic. So for me, that's the winner. But I completely understand why you prefer Brahmin. Yeah, and I think just in general, I've loved going back with these to these comics because it's like stepping back into when the expanded universe yeah. was good. And and it was yeah. meaningful, and it was it was nice wa- reading this for the first time because I, I I was kicking myself partly because like why haven't I read this in so long it's so good but I'm also glad because now I had this new thing I could talk mm-hmm. about and be happy that I read. So yeah, I've been looking forward to talking about it with you since I read it because I knew we'd have some different perspectives on it. Yeah, I mean, and I will I have to point out at the end of the book, um, at least in the version that I read. They have, like, historical context. Yeah. They give you these little excerpts of what the historical characters are and who they or Sorry, who they are and what, they, yeah, what they're doing. Yeah, they tell you about Ranjit Singh, like, right? Is that his name? That Yeah, that's, 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 that's what I just was complaining about with conspiracies. And this book did it, and it came out seven yeah. years ago. So, Absolutely. Yeah, Brahmin, I'm going to say it. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, I'm, I'm going to say it, all right? It's pretty good. <laughs> what would you rate Brahmin out of 10? Out of 10, I'm going to have to get an 8.5. Ooh, I'm going to give it an 8. Wow, so even though you had more problems with it than me, we rated it very similarly. We rated it pretty close. Brahmin is a, a phenomenal piece of writing, and just the fact alone that it goes so far to make you care about Jot and care about the characters... It puts in so much more legwork to that character empathy than any of these other books do. So many of them feel like you can just create an easy shortcut to empathy by killing someone's family or, uh, you know, having something terrible happen to them. This is just a guy who, like, he could be the main character in a romantic comedy. This could be a romantic comedy setup. But because the human drama of it is portrayed so vividly and lifelike... It becomes the perfect starting point for an action thriller Assassin's Creed story. It's it's very relatable, and uh, you mentioning that I completely agree. Like this, he could totally be just a character in anything, and yeah. they wove it into the Assassin's Creed sto- uh, story and mythos so well. And I just hope that we get a story like this sometime in the future. Um, I hope that maybe one day. Um, because this is the way you do, I think, a modern day character getting swept up in the, in the conflict mm-hmm. because he doesn't end the book and he's like, I'm going to become an assassin, which I would not be opposed to seeing maybe one day. Who knows? Yeah. But he's still around. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's still, still around. And I, I, look, I'm not going to say that every main character in modern day needs to become an assassin or Templar, but I would, I'm curious what he does after this, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm glad that it didn't end with him like putting on a hood or whatever, yeah, but that would have been so cheap. And it speaks to exactly something we talked about last week. This isn't a chosen one story. It's explicitly yes. 
not a chosen one story. He's, yeah, it's explicitly not that. Yeah, he's the sidekick of the historical, and that's fantastic. That's something I want more of because, like we say, you can't make everyone a chosen one. And luckily, in Brahmin, they did not make him a chosen one. Daniel Cross is a chosen one. Eddie Gorm is a chosen one. Aliyah Khan is a chosen one. But Jatsura, he's just Jatsura, man. He's just doing yeah, his we, thing. I mean, yeah. We need more we, we need more stories like that. Give us sure. more Jot. Please. So I wanted to ask you a quick question, um, perhaps to kind of uh, circle everything back. Um, do you have like a favorite moment? Because I have a particular moment that I, I just I laughed out loud at and I, I wanted to share it and I didn't know if you had anything like like that for yourself. Tell me yours first. So I really I really love the uh, panels where um, Arbaz is freed from his cell and he's like he's like yeah no no thanks I'm gonna get it out of here now and she's like well you you can't do that without the diamond he's like I have it right here <laughs> and he and the little boy uh, gave it to her yeah and he, and like it's just so funny because it's even though it's not in motion mm-hmm. I looked at it in motion the way Arbaz looked back at him yeah. you know oh, yeah all yeah it's so great. Uh, before you started talking, I was going to say that was my favorite moment, too. But just to be different, I'll choose a different one. <laughs> and I will choose the moment when the boy gives her the Koei North Diamond. Because, like, is he a simp? Yes. But. Aren't we all? Aren't we all? And it's so sweet. He just sees a beautiful royal woman crying. And he's like, you know what? You I may know. be a little deaf, mute little kid. But I happen to have in my possession the most fabulous, beautiful, awe-inspiring, magical jewel that has ever existed. And I would give it to you just to make you feel better. Is he deaf? No, he's just mute. I keep saying deaf, mute. Oh. <laughs> it, it, it's all it's, the same. It, it he's blind. Fuck it. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. He's a blind deaf kid. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just, I'll, I'll strategically edit out every time I've said Death. <laughs> no, just bleep it. Just censor it. So they don't know what, this fucking they don't, mute. I <laughs> <laughs> don't. They don't know what you're saying. <laughs> if you if you go back and you hear an awkward pause every time I talk about this kid, where I say he's a mute kid, you'll know why <laughs> right now. Because I'll leave this in. <laughs> That's so perfect. <laughs> All right. Anything else we want to say about Brahmin? Um, if you have, okay, well, if you haven't read it and you've listened to this, rewind and don't listen to it and go read it. Um, no, but overall, yeah, just like I, as I've kind of said, great book. Uh, my favorite of the comics we've read. Um, there are, there are more that we are to read so far. This is the best one. And I think if anyone hasn't read it in a little while and this is kind of like bringing back some memories of it, I totally suggest rereading it. I think you'll like it um, just as much as you did. It gets two thumbs up from the, from, from the blockade podcast, <laughs> the blockade podcast, the blockade. Um, podcast. Sorry. It's book blade for this episode. Don't go, sorry, don't sorry. go blowing our, our name pun. Also, load. we can't use assassins read. That's been taken. I'm sure it has. Of course it has. No, it has been. No, it has. It's, it's, uh, it, well, I, I don't know if I should say it. Who, who has assassins read? Loomer. <laughs> Damn it. Loomer. <laughs> Loomer has everything. Okay. Loomer. If you're listening to this, we're out to get you. Yeah, yeah, we're we're gonna we're gonna get Assassin's Read from you. I'm gonna call my just, lawyer, wait. and we're gonna change our delightful, unique podcast name, the Hook Blade Podcast, and we're gonna call it Assassin's Read just to spite you, Loomer, <laughs> just to spite you, <laughs> just you. All right, well, um, thank you for listening to everyone except Loomer. <laughs> <laughs> this is. <laughs> This has been the Book Blade podcast. <laughs> I've I've been the hook and I've been the blade. We'll see you next week. Yeah. So you can use one or the other. Yeah.